Welcome to the Deep Dive. Our mission, like always, is to really jump into a bunch of sources, you know, articles, research our notes, and pull out those key bits of knowledge, those surprising facts, and yeah, those aha moments that help make you genuinely well-informed. Today, we're taking a really fascinating dive into a critical medical area, lower limb angiograms and angioplasties. For a lot of people, this isn't just some procedure. It's a, it's a way back to moving freely and seriously improving their quality of life. We're going to unpack the why, the how, and all those important what ifs. And what's quite interesting about our source material today is where it comes from. We're looking directly at uh, patient consent forms and these detailed info sheets. So it gives us this very practical view showing exactly what patients are told, you know, focusing on the essential facts they need before deciding. Absolutely. Because when you think about what these procedures actually offer, it's like a real roadmap into the body's, well, pretty complex artery system. And the huge difference they can make in someone's day-to-day -day life, it's its quite something. Imagine someone, let's call her Clara, struggling with leg pain that just stops her doing things. Today, we'll sort of follow the path she might take if her doctor suggests this. It's a journey with big considerations, and we're here to walk you through it. So to really start at uh, square one, let's break down these terms. What exactly is an angiogram? Right. An angiogram essentially is a diagnostic imaging procedure. It's designed to pinpoint problems inside your arteries, those vital blood vessels carrying oxygen-rich blood from your heart. It uses a special um, colorless fluid, a contract fluid, injected into your bloodstream and then combines that with x-rays to create these incredibly detailed real-time pictures. Like a map, you said. Exactly. Think of it like a very precise moving roadmap of your arteries. It lets doctors see exactly where any blockages or you know narrow spots might be hiding. Okay. And often, right alongside that roadmap comes another procedure, the angioplasty. What's that, and why are they uh, so often done together? Good question. So the angioplasty is the treatment part. It's often done right after or even during the angiogram. The whole point is to widen or unblock an artery that's gotten too narrow or maybe even completely blocked off. How do they do that? Typically, they thread a very fine tube, a catheter, that has a tiny balloon on its tip right to where the blockage is. Then they carefully inflate that balloon. It stretches the artery open. Then they deflate it and take it out. And sometimes they leave something behind, a stent. Yes, exactly. Often a stent, which is basically a small metal mesh tube, is put into the artery right after the balloon part. It acts like a tiny scaffold, propping the artery open and helping stop it from narrowing down again. So doing them together is just efficient. Pretty much. The angiogram shows where the problem is, gives that precise diagnosis, and then the angioplasty provides the immediate fix, often all in the same session. Saves time, gets the treatment done right away. Okay, so... Thinking about Clara again, why would her vascular surgeon even suggest this, this look inside her arteries? What are the actual accepted reasons, the indications? Well, there are several key signs, and they all point back to not enough blood getting through. Patients like Clara might need this if they've developed a gangrene that's uh, tissue of death because the blood supply is critically low. That sounds serious. That is. Another big one is rest pain. That means having significant leg pain even when you're just lying down, not moving at all. Again, a sign of really poor blood flow. Then there are non-healing ulcers, especially on the legs or feet. That's another clear signal. And what about just difficulty walking? Right. That's called limiting claudication. It's that pain you get in your legs when you walk, and it forces you to stop after maybe, maybe less than 200 meters. All these things tell the doctor the arteries aren't delivering enough oxygen, and it's either impacting daily life significantly or you know, risking tissue damage. And if someone is going through that, what are the real tangible benefits they can expect after the procedure? Oh, the benefits can be huge, really life-changing for many. The main goal is to significantly improve the blood supply to the leg or legs that are affected. So for someone with that claudication, that walking pain- like walk further, less pain. Exactly. They can often walk much further with much less pain. It can mean regaining a lot of independence. And if someone has ulcers or gangrene, getting more blood flow there is absolutely essential for healing. It's key to preventing further tissue loss. When you look at the bigger picture, it's really about restoring function. The procedure directly tackles the problem, the blocked arteries. By getting that blood flowing again, the aim is to relieve those severe symptoms, improve quality of life, and yeah, in the more serious cases, prevent much worse outcomes. Like amputation. Potentially, yes. In severe cases, it can prevent the need for amputation. It's an intervention that can literally save a limb and help someone get their life back. That's incredibly powerful. Mm. But are there other options? 
Other ways Claire's doctor might look at her arteries or treat a blockage. Yes, absolutely. It's always important to know the alternatives. For just getting pictures, the diagnostic part, there's Doppler ultrasound or an MRA that's magnetic resonance angiogram or a CTA CT angiogram. But they aren't quite the same. Well, our sources point out they can give images, but they're generally not considered as detailed as the standard angiogram. And crucially, you can't combine them with an angioplasty to treat the problem right then and there. So they give information, but not the immediate treatment option. And for treatment itself, instead of angioplasty. The main surgical alternative is bypass surgery. That involves creating a whole new path for the blood to flow around the blocked section, usually using a graft, like a piece of vein or a synthetic tube. It better or worse. It's different. Bypass surgery can be very effective, and it's the right choice for some people, but it's generally considered a bigger operation. It's not suitable for everyone, and it usually comes with a higher risk of complications and definitely a longer recovery time compared to angioplasty. Okay, so that leads to a really important question. Yeah. What if Clara, or any patient, hears all this and decides not to go ahead with the angiogram and angioplasty? What happens then? Well, if a patient decides against it, the underlying issue, the poor blood flow, isn't treated. That means their symptoms, the pain, or the ulcers are unlikely to get better. In fact, they often get worse over time. And the ulcers are gangrene. They're unlikely to heal properly without better blood supply. And in really severe cases where the blood flow is critically low, it could unfortunately progress to the point where an amputation becomes necessary to save the rest of the leg or even the patient's life. But it's still their choice. Absolutely. It is always the patient's right to decide. That's why understanding all this, the pros and cons, the alternatives, the risks of not doing it, mm -hmm. that's what informed consent is all about. But yeah, you need to understand the potential consequences of inaction too. Right. Let's shift gears now. Let's say Clara decides to proceed. Walk us through what that actually involves for her. What kind of prep work is needed before the procedure day? Okay, preparation is definitely key. For women, a pregnancy test is usually done because of the x-rays. Very important. If you're taking blood thinning meditations, things like warfarin or maybe clopidogrel, you'll usually need to stop those about a week before, but that's always under specific advice from your doctor. Don't just stop them yourself. What about other meds, like for diabetes? Good point. If you have diabetes and take metformin, there's special advice there too. You might need to stop it on the day of the procedure and for a couple of days after. Sometimes they'll want a blood test before you restart it. Again, follow your doctor's instructions precisely. Anything else? Yes. Stopping smoking is strongly recommended. That's huge, not just for this procedure, but for your long-term artery health. You'll also be told to drink plenty of fluids beforehand to stay hydrated. Then, usually no food for about four hours before, though clear fluids like water are often okay. And finally, since the entry point is typically the groin, the femoral artery, that's the one, mm. you might be asked to shave that area at home before you come in. Okay, quite a checklist. So procedure day arrives, Claire is in the x-ray room. What actually happens then? What's it like during that hour or two? Right, so once you're in the x-ray room, the procedure itself usually takes about one to two hours. You'll be lying flat on your back on a special table. They might offer you a sedative or a painkiller just to help you relax. Do they monitor you? Oh, constantly. Your oxygen levels, heart rate, blood pressure, all monitored throughout. The team cleans the groin area thoroughly and covers you with sterile drapes. It's a very clean environment. Then comes the local anesthetic injection in the groin. Does it hurt? It stings for a moment, yes, but then the area goes numb pretty quickly. That allows the surgeon to insert a needle, then a thin guide wire, and finally, the catheter, that main thin tube into the femoral artery without you feeling pain there. And then the dye. What's that like? Ah, yes, the contrast dye. When they inject that, you'll likely feel this warm, flush sensation for a few seconds. It might feel like it spreads all over or maybe just locally. And here's that interesting detail from the forms. The peeing sensation. Exactly. Many people report feeling like they need to pass urine or even that they are. But rest assured, you are absolutely not. It's just a temporary sensation caused by the dye. It passes quickly. Okay, good to know. What else happens? They'll also give you some blood thinning medication, usually heparin, through the catheter itself to prevent any clots forming during the procedure. If an angioplasty is needed, they thread another fine tube with the balloon to the narrow spot. Inflate, deflate. Inflate to open the artery, deflate, and remove it. And maybe place a stent, as we discussed, to keep it propped open. Once everything's done, they take the catheter out 
Then they apply firm pressure to the spot in your groin for a while, or sometimes they use a special stitch or a closure device, like a plug, to help seal the small hole in the artery. That is incredibly detailed. It really paints a picture. So after all that, what's the recovery period like? How soon before Clara can get back to normal? Recovery starts right away in a dedicated recovery area. The nurses will keep a close watch on your heart rate, blood pressure, and very importantly, check your groin frequently for any signs of bleeding or swelling. Can you go home the same day? Most people can, yes. It's often done as a day case. However, and this is crucial, if you had any sedation, there are strict rules for the next 24 hours. You absolutely must have a responsible adult drive you home and stay with you. Why stay with you? Because the sedative can affect your judgment and coordination for longer than you might realize. You need to be near a phone. And you absolutely cannot drive a car, operate machinery, not even cooking, as that can be risky or do anything potentially dangerous. No signing contracts either. Correct. No signing legal documents and no drinking alcohol for at least 24 hours your decision-making might be impaired. Also, for the first day or two, you should avoid any strenuous exercise. Just take it easy to let that puncture site in the groin heal up properly. All right. Okay, now, here's where it gets really interesting and maybe a bit daunting for patients. No medical procedure is completely risk-free. We have to talk about potential complications. What should people be aware of? Absolutely. Understanding risks is critical for informed consent. Let's start with the more common things, which are usually less serious. Some bleeding at the insertion site is quite common. It might cause a small collection of blood under the skin that's called a hematoma, leading to some bruising. Usually that's not serious and just goes away on its own. But sometimes it's worse. Less commonly, yes. A large hematoma can form. The stats suggest less than 2 in 100 cases. This might need treatment, possibly even a blood transfusion, or rarely another procedure or surgery to sort it out. There's also something called a false aneurysm. What's that? It's like a bulging sac connected to the artery wall near the puncture site. It happens in maybe one in 500 cases. Interestingly, the risk seems to be lower if you rest properly, lying fairly flat for at least four hours after the procedure. And what about damage during the actual procedure to the artery itself? That can happen during the angioplasty part, maybe in about one in 100 cases. Usually, if it occurs, the team can treat it right then and there, often using techniques similar to the angioplasty itself, like putting in a covered stent. But sometimes surgery is needed. In less than 1 in 100 cases, yes, a surgical repair might be necessary if the damage can't be fixed interventionally. And this leads to the most serious, though thankfully very rare, complication the loss of a limb. Mm. If artery damage occurs and cannot be fixed by surgery, it could, in less than 1 in 500 cases, lead to amputation. It's very rare, but it has to be mentioned. Wow. That's definitely sobering. What about other kinds of risks, like allergic reactions? People worry about dyes. Yes, allergic reactions are a possibility. It mm -hmm. could be to the equipment, the materials, medications used, or the contrast dye. Most often, it's just a mild skin rash that settles down. More serious reactions are rare, less than 1 in 2,500 cases. And life-threatening. Extremely rare, maybe 1 in 25,000. But the crucial thing is the medical team is fully trained and equipped to recognize and treat any reaction immediately. They're prepared for it. Okay, what else? Kidneys. You mentioned the dye. Right. The kidneys have to filter out that contrast dye. There is a risk of kidney damage. Serious damage happens in less than 1 in 100 cases, and the risk of needing dialysis, even temporarily, is less than 1 in 500. Is the risk higher for some people? Yes, definitely. If you already have kidney problems or if you have diabetes, the risk is higher. That's why they always check your kidney function beforehand and take precautions, like ensuring you're well hydrated. And radiation. X-rays mean radiation. They do. There's a very small additional lifetime risk of developing cancer from the radiation exposure. It's considered very low for a single procedure, but the risk does add up over multiple exposures and is slightly higher if you're younger. The team always aims to use the lowest possible dose of radiation and the fewest number of x-rays needed to do the job safely and effectively. Anything else? Can the procedure just not work? Yeah. Yes, that's another possibility, a failed angioplasty. This means the procedure is done, but it doesn't actually improve the symptoms as hoped. It's considered more likely if the artery was completely blocked to start with rather than just narrowed, or if the blockages are in smaller arteries further down the leg, like below the knee. And do certain patients just have higher risks overall? 
Generally, yes. Your overall risk of complications tends to be higher if you're older, if you're significantly overweight, if you smoke, or if you have other major health issues like diabetes, heart disease, or lung disease. All these factors play a role, which is why the discussion about your personal risk with your doctor is so incredibly important. Those consent forms really lay it all out. Absolutely. It's a lot to take in, but so vital. So think about the bigger picture now, the long game. Beyond the procedure and the immediate recovery, what are the really crucial takeaways for someone's overall health, especially for preventing this from happening again? This is maybe the most critical part, the ultimate aha moment, perhaps. Lifestyle changes are absolutely paramount. Mm -hmm. Number one, if you smoke, stopping now is the single most important thing you can do. Why is it so crucial? Because smoking is a major cause of arteries narrowing in the first place. The procedure can open things up, yes, but if you keep smoking, you're actively working against that fix. You significantly increase the risk of the arteries narrowing again, maybe elsewhere, and just generally damaging your vascular health long term and beyond smoking. Maintaining a healthy weight is really important. And getting regular exercise the right kind, of course, always discuss it with your doctor or healthcare team first. These things aren't just nice to haves. They're fundamental to improving your long term health and reducing the chances of needing more procedures down the road. So the the procedure is like a reset, yeah. but the lifestyle is the maintenance. That's a great way to put it. The procedure is a vital intervention. It tackles the immediate, often critical problem. But the true lasting fix for your vascular health really depends heavily on the choices you make every single day. It's about taking proactive control after the medical team has done their part. Okay, so let's try and wrap this deep dive up. A lower limb angiogram and angioplasty, from what we've discussed, seems generally safe and definitely effective for diagnosing and helping with symptoms of blocked leg arteries. But as we've really dug into, understanding all the details of PrEP, what happens during, and especially those potential complications, is just so key for anyone, like our imagined Clara, making a truly informed decision. Precisely. And we really have to stress again, this discussion, this deep dive, it's for information. It's to give you context and understanding. It absolutely should not and cannot replace the specific personalized advice you'd get from your own doctors and healthcare team. They know your history, your specific situation. Use this as a launch kit for questions. Exactly. Hopefully this gives you a solid foundation, empowers you to ask really good questions, and helps you partner with your medical team to make the best choices for your own health. So what does this all mean then? In this age where we have these incredibly advanced medical tools, these powerful procedures, how do we best find that balance between using that power effectively and embracing our own role, our own agency through lifestyle choices for really comprehensive long-term health? What's the big takeaway that stands out to you listening today from this journey into arteries and interventions? 